story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Now, I didn't quite finish off the last talk, so let me finish that off. I'm trying to show you that this internal situation in the church in Rome, the tension between Jew and Gentile, is really the key to the whole letter. And Paul is dealing with it on every page. He uses all kinds of doctrines and thoughts to deal with it, but he's basically after removing the tension between Jew and Gentile. You see, in the Old Testament, that was a deep, deep gulf. And if you went to the temple... There was a great barrier there between the Gentile court and the other courts and the notices on the barrier said, no Gentiles. And you remember that Paul was arrested because he was falsely accused of taking a Gentile beyond that barrier. Well, he didn't actually physically take a Gentile beyond the barrier, but spiritually he'd been doing it for 20 years. Because he says in Ephesians 2, the middle wall of partition has been broken down now and Jew and Gentile come together into the holy place. So that that's what he'd been preaching, but finally they accused him of practicing it in the temple. And that's when he was arrested in the riot in Jerusalem. So he's, it's touching a very sensitive spot in Paul's heart that Jews and Gentiles in Rome, both believers in Jesus, are nevertheless in tension with each other. And so he says, you're all sinners, you're all justified by faith, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're all sons of Abraham by faith, no difference between you. And then he says, now you Gentiles, stop your license, you Jews, stop your legalism, and chapter 8, get into the liberty of the Spirit. Then chapters 9 to 11, he talks about the history of the Jews, their past, their present, and their future. And he says, I'll tell you a secret. One day they're all going to come back in. A wonderful secret there. Of course, all they will need to do that is to see Jesus. And when they see him, the whole nation will realize what a mistake they made hundreds of years ago. But when we get to the practical part of Romans, even in that part, chapters 12 to 16, dealing with practical issues of conduct, he only deals with those issues which will cause tension between Jewish and Gentile believers. Now, what kind of issue would cause tension? Food. That's the first obvious thing, diet, because Jews are so strict about diet. So he mentions food offered to idols. And he deals with that problem, the food that the Jewish believers feel they can't touch and Gentiles seem happy to touch. Then he deals with this matter of having a special day each week. Once again, he's dealing with attention. Gentile believers didn't have Sunday observance. There's an awful lot of silly thinking about Sunday observance going around. Listen, Sunday is not a Sabbath. We worship God on Sunday because it's the eighth day of creation. It's the first day of the second week of creation. And Sunday is the first day of God's working week. And we're not commemorating his rest or we'd worship on Saturday. We're celebrating that he's gone back to work, which is what he did on Easter Sunday. And he started recreating the entire universe. Only this time around, whereas the first six days of creation he created the heavens and the earth first and people last, he's now creating new people first and the new heaven and the new earth last. But we're into the second week of creation. So hallelujah, Sunday will be the busiest day of the week for all Christians. Not a day of rest, as you'll soon find out. It's the busiest day for God. More people are new creation in Christ on Sunday than any other day of the week. Spirit was poured out on Sunday. So Sunday is a day of celebration for Christians, but it was never a day of rest in the early church. For 300 years, Christians could not worship at 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m which, as you know, is the law of the Medes and the Persians. <laughs> but you see, they had to worship very early morning, four or five in the morning, and about nine or ten at night. Because Jewish believers, they only got a day's holiday on Saturday. 
Gentile believers got the Roman holiday, which was every tenth day, and not every seventh, and slaves got no day's holiday at all, and most of the early Christians were slaves, so that they could not observe Sunday for 300 years. But in a church made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers, can you see the tension that would arise? The Jews kept their special day, Saturday. Gentiles didn't keep a special day. And Paul says, listen, it's entirely a matter of choice. Whatever you do, do to the Lord. If one, one of you wants to keep one day special, that's fine. Let him do that to the Lord. And if others of you want to regard all the days as the Lord's day, fine. You're free to do that too. Don't judge each other. See? But let everyone be fully persuaded in their own mind. Now there are issues like this that we've got to face today and we need this same kind of flexibility that we don't lay demands on one another. The Lord leads us to do something but that doesn't mean you've got to tell everybody else they've got to do it. Only if it's in Scripture for all believers can you command that of others. But there are many areas in which we make rules for each other which are not in Scripture and we've got to learn to live together. So Paul deals with these tensions. Even in that last part of his letter, he's dealing with the tensions that come when you've got a fellowship of Jewish and Gentile believers together. There are now the beginnings of more and more Jewish churches. Did you know that? There's a Messianic fellowship in London now. And bless them, they came to me and said, would you be one of the elders? I said, I'm deeply honoured that you should ask a Gentile to be an elder of a Jewish assembly of believers. I said, I don't feel it's right for me to do. I couldn't fulfill the responsibilities with my present ministry. But I said, thank you for asking me. Why did you ask me? And they said, well, we don't want to be exclusively Jewish. And I thought, that's great. But they're going to worship on a Saturday. Fine. Fine. There's no law that they've got to worship on a Sunday. There's no law that we've got to. Now it's a day of rest. The Emperor Constantine, when he became a Christian, established Christianity. I, I think it was the worst thing that ever happened to Christianity. Some people think it was the best, but suddenly everybody had to be Christian and all the shops had to close on Sunday and Sunday had to be a day of rest so Christians could lie in. <laughs> and I tell you, if we went back to worshipping at four in the morning and ten at night, we'd soon find out who the real Christians were get rid of Sunday Christians fairly quickly. So you see, Paul is dealing in this letter all the way through from beginning to end with a bunch of believing believers in the city of Rome trying to live for Christ in the face of appalling social conditions, but with this internal tension between Jewish and Gentile believers. And if you read the letter to the Romans now with that in mind, you'll realize we found the key. Now we're ready to look at the epistle itself and what it teaches and here again I think half an hour, what can I say to you? Read it. Read it. Read it and read it again. Many have benefited very greatly from spending time reading this book. But I can give you a few clues. Let's look at some key words. Once again, you may not notice it. It's tragic that we don't notice the word God when we read the Bible. It's that strange, but we, we skip over it. We're too familiar with it. But the word God is the key word. It occurs more than any other word. 153 times, which is once for every 46 verses. If you like playing with calculators, you can go away and do it. But that is the key. This is about God. You're God's people. You Jews, you Gen you're God's people. And it's God who's the centre and focus of your church. When you put the words Christ and Lord together, together that gives you the second most frequent mention, even though I've put them like this. Christ 65 times, Lord 43 times, but put it together and you've got 108 times. <coughs> so really those two together could come up here. Interestingly enough, law comes in as the next most frequent word. You see, sometimes the key to a book in the Bible is how often one word occurs. It gives you the emphasis. Sometimes it can mislead, but often it's a good guide. 
law comes in a lot. He discusses the law greatly because these Jews have come back in with all their legalism and he's got to stop that coming back in and dominating the church. It was all right when it was an entirely Jewish fellowship to keep the Sabbath and kosher food, but now it's a Gentile fellowship. The Jews are coming back in. And they've got to be careful what they do with the law, lest they try and turn the Gentiles into Jews. Then the word sin comes in. You know, there's the classic story of a new preacher came and somebody went to hear him and when they came back home, they were asked, what did he preach about? And uh, they said he preached about sin. What did he say about it? Oh, he was against it. <laughs> Which um, we should be. But Paul is against sin and he, that word keeps coming in all the way through. And he's not just talking about the sin out there in the city of Rome, he's talking about sin in here among believers. And he's saying it doesn't matter where it is, God is against sin whether it's in believers or unbelievers <coughs> and he will judge it. And it's very important to realize, let me sum it like this, summarize it like this, Christians are justified by faith but they will be judged by works because works are the fruit of faith and therefore sin in Christian does matter. It's very important. So sin is a key concept even though he's talking to Christians. And faith is the next one and then I think we've reached the limit except for this important word righteousness. Faith is mentioned 40 times. It's a very important, it's faith that unites them. They were united in sin before, they're now united in faith. They're all sons of Abraham through faith. But now the key word, the key concept, the key thought that comes is righteousness and particularly the righteousness of God. Now do you know what led Martin Luther to faith? It was that phrase, the righteousness of God. He hated it. He feared it. And one day he was out in a thunderstorm and the lightning stuck a tree just by him and he fell to the ground and the thought that filled his mind was, the righteousness of God, I'm damned. And he saw the righteousness of God as something fearful, something that was so pure, so holy that it condemns us, damns us to hell. And then one day he realized that that phrase, the righteousness of God, means the righteousness he wants to give us. That it's not something he's going to keep to himself and judge us by, so much as something he wants to share with us. And the gospel is the gospel of the righteousness of God. It's good news. God wants to give you his righteousness. That's what it's all about. But of course to Gentiles and Jews there's a problem, but quite a different problem. To Gentiles the problem is their own unrighteousness, but with Jews the problem is their righteousness. And I don't know which is the more difficult group to deal with. Yes, I do. Good people are far harder to get into the kingdom than bad people. The self-righteous are really impossible. I once went to preach or to speak at the Baptist Women's League. That's not my scene. I feel like a lion in a den of Daniels in the Baptist Women's League, but I went there and a very, a very large personable lady came over to me and, and she said, uh, are you the speaker for this afternoon? I said, yes. She said, what are you going to speak on? I said, grace. Oh, she said, that sounds nice. So I got up to speak and there they all were and I said, I just want to tell you two things about grace. Number one, grace means that your bad deeds need not keep you out of heaven. All the ladies smiled at this young minister and they liked this. That was good. I said, secondly, your good deeds will not help you to get to heaven. And their faces fell and they didn't like me. I said, that's what grace means. And this dear chair lady came up to me afterwards, or chairperson should I say, came up to me afterwards and she said, uh, you trying to tell me that all the good things I've ever done have been wasted? I said, no, they weren't wasted for others, other people. They helped others, but they won't help you, no. She said, I thought that's what you said. And she never spoke to me again. I never got invited back to that meeting and that was it. <laughs> See, that's the offense of the righteousness of God. Because what it really is saying is that you've got to repent of your good deeds. 
Now unfortunately most people when they hear the word repentance think of all the bad deeds they should repent of. But no, the harder thing is to repent of good deeds. And to repent of your good deeds, that takes some doing. But you remember what I said, Paul said when he considered his righteousness, he felt it was human dung. My, that takes a bit of saying. The prophet Isaiah was equally blunt. He said something more appropriate to the ladies as Paul's remarks were for the men. What Isaiah said was, your righteousness is like a menstrual cloth. That's not something you want to parade in public. Now the Bible is saying that your righteousness can be the biggest barrier between you and the righteousness of God. And it's far harder. There's a revival going on in the British prisons right now. Did you know that? God is really moving in the prisons of our land. He's going to bring out real evangelists out of the prisons. You know, we'll, we're going to have spiritual porridge all over the land. <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? I mean, a friend of mine, when he was converted, he repented of his sins, he went to the police, he confessed to a crime that had never been discovered, and uh, he went, found himself in court, and because he'd confessed it, the judge gave him the lightest sentence of two months. And he went in, he told everybody about Jesus, they called him the bishop, but after two months he had to leave his disciples. So he went back to the police, confessed another crime, got back in, <laughs> And he, he told me, he said, I'm the only evangelist in Britain entirely financed by Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> but he's now a well-known national evangelist whose name most of you would have heard of. But uh, God's doing this. It's so much easier for people like that to enter the Kingdom of God. Uh, a television station in Canada that was broadcasting to the whole of Canada foolishly said to me, the director said, you can talk about anything you like for 20 minutes. I said, I'm going to talk about the Kingdom of God. And his face fell. He said, now it's a commercial channel, we've got to keep them interested and switched on. I said, that's what I want to talk about. It's my favourite subject and it was Jesus' favourite subject too. He said, all right. And I looked into the camera lens and just spoke for 20 minutes about the Kingdom. There were telephones in the studio for people to ring in and the first telephone went and a woman's voice said, hello, I'm a hooker. That's a prostitute over there on Yonge Street, Toronto. She said, I've been was watching your program. And she said, I've got a question to ask. I said, what's your question? She said, how could I get into that Kingdom, please? I said, why do you want to get in? She said, it's time I got my life straightened out. I thought, hallelujah, I'm preaching the right gospel at last. Because you can tell, if good people like the preaching, you're preaching the wrong gospel. If bad people like it, you're getting near it. Do you understand? And the gospel is the gospel of the righteousness of God. <laughs> you don't have to produce any of your own. It's all available to you in Christ. That's great news, isn't it? But it's bad news for those who've been in all the voluntary services and you know, been in Rotary and done so many good things, they're so hard to reach with the Gospel because they've just got too much goodness of their own. And real repentance means you turn away from your bad deeds and you turn away from your good deeds. I rarely hear preachers say, repent of your good deeds. But I tell you, the good deeds are more likely to keep people out of heaven than anything else. Because you feel good, you know, it's very rare in a prayer meeting that I ever hear anyone asking for mercy, which is tragic because God is so full of it that as soon as you ask for it, you get it. It's the one prayer you can be sure will be answered. But people need to feel they're pretty bad before they beg for mercy. So we ask for guidance and blessing and all the rest because we don't think we're really bad enough to beg for mercy. But when God hears a prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner, the gates of heaven fling wide open. He can't resist that kind of prayer. He's too full of mercy. You find the word mercy all the way through Romans. God is longing to give us His righteousness. He says, here, have some of mine. You'll never have enough of your own. So when you preach the gospel of righteousness, the problem with Gentiles is their unrighteousness. And they need to have a desire for righteousness to come to Christ. But the problem with Jews is they've got too much righteousness. And they say, I'm good enough. So Paul deals with both of those. 
and he gives us salvation as a process. I think you smiled earlier when I talked about recycling men and women, but I use that more than salvation now because people understand it. I want them to get the message. And salvation, the nearest English word is salvage, not safe. I find an awful lot of people want to be safe. But that's not the gospel, how to be safe. It's how to be salvaged, how to be recycled, how to be saved from the rubbish dump which Jesus called Gehenna, and how to be recycled, made useful to God again. Now that process of recycling takes time. And I'm always worried when somebody says to me, we had seven people saved last Sunday night. I say, no you didn't. You had seven who began to be saved. See, salvation is a process. I'm not saved yet, but I have much sympathy with the Negro preacher in the southern states who prayed thus. He said, Lord, I ain't what I ought to be, and I ain't what I'm going to be, but praise the Lord, I ain't what I was. <laughs> In other words, I'm being saved. The word saved occurs in three verbal tenses in the New Testament. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It says in Hebrews that Jesus is coming a second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So he's going to bring salvation to me, so I ain't got it yet. You see, the part of me that you can see isn't saved yet. I'm going to get a new body. Can't wait for it. It'll be 33 years old according to my Bible. Can't wait to be 33 again and when you're in your 60s. It's good news. The young people don't look as if it is, but never mind. <laughs> it's good news for those of us who are getting on a bit and there are a few grey heads here. I'm not the oldest here, I reckon. See, that's good news, but my body's not saved yet. It's not redeemed yet, but it's going to be. And there are bits of me that you can't see yet that are not saved yet. You know the most challenging thing was ever asked me, I think. There was a man came to our church in Guildford for the first time. I knew it was the first time and he lived not far from us. And I thought, I'll give him a lift home in the car and I'll get a second bite at the cherry, you know. So I got him in the car afterwards and I took him home. I said, what do you think of the service? I said, first time in church? She said, yeah, for a long time. I said, well, what do you think of the service? Oh, all right. What about the preaching? No, he said, you said something. He said, you said Jesus saves you from your sins. I said, that's right, he does. That's why he's called Jesus. He said, give me a list of all the sins he saved you from. Oh boy, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? And I confess with shame the first one I thought of I hadn't been saved from yet. And God used an unbeliever to tell me, you don't let me save you. You see? Now Jesus didn't just come to give us a ticket to heaven and forgive the past. He came to save us. And he didn't come to save us from hell, that's a bonus thrown in. He came to save us from our sins and take away the sins of the world. Get them right out. So how many of you are saved from your sins? See, you're being saved. It's a process. And just to spell it out in rather complicated terms, but Paul uses some of these terms. He doesn't use those first three terms, theologians use those. And I've put them there just so you'll recognize them when you hear them. If you read commentaries on Romans, you'll come across them. But let's start here. Justification, sanctification, glorification. I don't like those words one bit. They're Latin English. And Latin English words are long, multisyllabled, and abstract. And I don't like them. That's why good preaching uses Anglo Saxon English. Instead of saying, blood, tears, toil and sweat, which is Anglo-Saxon. Latin English says sacrifice, sorrow, labour and perspiration. <laughs> well now, which really communicates with you, sweat or perspiration? Well, horses sweat and men perspire, but ladies only glow, they tell me, but <laughs> all right. But these are Latinized words, but let's take them. Justification. There's a New Guinea Bible, Pigeon English. Somebody here has been in New Guinea. Where are you? Somebody's told me they were. Anyway, there's a pidgin English. Maybe they're having a rest. A pidgin English. And instead of justified, which doesn't touch me at all, do you know what it has? It has God, he say, him all right. <laughs> now, isn't that beautiful? I mean, look how your faces have lit up. That's marvelous translation. 
It's to be in God's good books. It's for God to say, he's all right. Whatever other people think about that man or that woman, they're all right in my book. It's justification. A beautiful blessing, but it's only the beginning of salvation. But it sets us free from the penalty of sin, which is a broken relationship with God. And God says, you're all right. You're my son. See, every other religion in the world says, put yourself right and then you can be right with God. This religion says, God says you're all right first. There was a man in the north of England I knew who was in charge of what was then called a borstal, uh, a reform school for bad lads. And there was one boy in that school, he tried to reform, but he couldn't do anything with him. He tried the hard treatment, bread and water, tried the soft treatment, privileges. Nothing changed him. He was a rebel. And one day my friend called him into his office and he said, now look, I've tried everything to get you turned around, but he said, I've got one more thing I want to try and I can't do it without your permission. He said, I want to adopt you, my son. I want you to take my name so that if you get into trouble from now on, it'll be my name that you'll drag down. I want you to leave this place and come and live in my home. And the boy looked up. He said, well, will you give me permission to do this? And the boy said, yes. Now, if I told you that from that day the boy lived a perfectly good life, I'd be telling you a lie. But if I told you from that moment he wanted to, then I'd be telling you the truth. And that's why God puts justification before sanctification. He says, let's clear this penalty of sin out of the way. You're my adopted son. You're in the family. It's my name that you'll drag down now. You're coming out of this school. You're coming out from under the law. You're coming into grace. You're coming into adoption. That's how it begins, but that's only the beginning of salvation. Too many people think they've arrived when they've got that. They haven't. They've set off from the right platform. So the second part of being saved is sanctification. Having been set free from the penalty of sin, the broken relationship, now restored, now we're set free from the power of it. So the grip of it is broken. And sanctification comes as much to faith as justification. We're justified by faith, we're sanctified by faith. You don't have to produce it yourself, but you do need to go on trusting every moment. And one day the whole process will be completed in glorification when we're set free from the presence of sin altogether. Fancy living in a world in which there's nothing you can't enjoy, in which there's no temptation. Can you imagine it? Nothing you can't have. Boy, that'll be heaven, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and so the theologians talk about righteousness imputed because we're justified on the basis of faith in Christ so that his righteousness covers our unrighteousness. We're putting on Christ when we're baptized into Christ, we're clothed with him, we're baptized into him, so now God can only see him when he looks at us. We're hidden in Christ. It's imputed, but it needs to be imparted as well. It's not just to cover us, it's to become part of us. God wants to impart his righteousness to us, not just credit it to us. The moment we believe, that's credited to us for righteousness. But then God wants us to become righteous as well. And ultimately that process will be completed only when we stand in glory and see him as he is. I'm sorry, I've... <laughs> Given you a bad noise there. Right. So salvation is the theme that he uses to bring Jew and Gentile together. Let's just look finally at an outline of Romans. I can't take you through it, it would be too long. I've tried to give you a feel of it. You can split it very neatly into faith, hope, and love. That's a trinity of virtues that again and again is picked up by New Testament writers. We'll see it particularly in 1 Peter. But the first four chapters is all about faith. And then a new word comes in chapter 5, hope. And it looks to the future. Faith looks to the past and what God has done in Christ. Hope looks to the future and what he's going to do. Not just with Gentiles but with Israel as well. And then in chapters 12 to 16, the third word appears, love. That's concerned with the present and working it out. 
Now, a shock for those of you who are taking notes. <laughs> How about that? And believe me, that's the simplest outline I could find. Well, I mean, it's mine. I, I've got a much longer and a much more detailed outline written here, but I wouldn't dare even to begin to give it to you in nine minutes that I've got left. But I'd like you to get the shape of it, the structure of Romans, so that you can get the feel of it. And I always analyse with the 1A system, uh, get the big divisions, then subdivide, and sometimes I go to uh, this subdivided and then even this subdivided. So I go A1, A1, big A, big one, little a, little one. And that is a very helpful way of breaking up a scripture so that you can see the structure of it and see how it's built up. But I've tried to be as simple as I can in this outline. Let's deal with the beginning and the end because he has his greetings here and here. Just deal with that. He begins by giving them his message, which is Trinitarian, God, Son, Spirit. And in the opening he just lays that out, the Trinitarian salvation, which he preaches. And then he gives greetings to the whole group, to the body corporate, gives greetings to the saints in Rome together. But when we get to the end of the letter, he doesn't talk about his message, but he does talk about his method of evangelism. And it's very important we get this, because in Romans 15 he says, you heard my message, you saw how I lived, and you witnessed signs and wonders, all by the power of the Holy Spirit, thus I have fully communicated the gospel to you. Well, he didn't say to you because he hadn't been to Rome. But he said, thus I have fully communicated the gospel all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum, that's modern Albania. And he did it by word, deed and sign. Nowadays we talk about words, work and works and wonders. Have you heard that? Ever since signs and wimbers came onto the agenda, we talk about <laughs> words, works and wonders. But word, deed and sign, do you notice that two of these are for the eye and one for the ear? One in the eye is worth two in the ear, but two in the eye and one in the ear is good communication. Listen, people aren't waiting to hear the gospel, but they are waiting to see it. And they have a right to see it, and we have a responsibility to show it to them, to demonstrate as well as declare the gospel. And Paul did that. He declared it, but he demonstrated with the human confirmation of how he lived and the divine confirmation of signs and wonders. We should seek to do the same. And then he has a whole lot of greetings for individuals or from individuals. So he begins with corporate greetings, he ends with individual greetings, a whole chapter four. Now having got the beginning and the end of his letter out of the way, let's just get the threefold stages of his argument. And each of the three main stages is subdivided into three smaller stages. And I'm not forcing him into this pattern. It's there very clearly. You read it and you'll find this pattern as clear as crystal. He's a very systematic thinker, is Paul, and he works through it. I wondered even if he had this kind of outline before he started writing. I don't know. But it fits very well. The first eight chapters, Paul's account of his gospel for Jew and Gentile. Always went to the Jew first, but then to the Gentile. He said, I owe it to the whole world. I wonder if you ever feel that. People say, have we the right to tell other religions about Jesus? You don't have a right to. You're in debt, and the debt can't be paid until you do. Paul said, I'm in debt. I'm a debtor to Jew and the Gentile. I owe it to them. It's not a right to tell them about the gospel. It's a responsibility. We're paying off a debt. Why should God bless you? If you discovered a cure for cancer, you would have a duty to tell everybody else. You wouldn't say, have I a right to go and tell them I found a cure for cancer? You would say, I owe it to everybody who's suffering from it. Well, Paul was a debtor. And this account of his gospel was centered in this theme of righteousness. Righteousness is revealed in Rome and in our pagan world in his wrath against society. And the proof of that wrath, among others, is that people are guilty of uncontrolled appetites and unnatural relationships. 
and you see that on every hand, uncontrolled appetites and unnatural, kinky relationships. And it's all there. But the righteousness is not only revealed in God's wrath against sin, it is credited to us through Christ's death. And because he bore all our sin, we can have his righteousness. Never forget that the cross was a double substitution. What do I mean by that? Some people are very happy to pile their sins on Jesus on the cross and say he's taken them away. But Jesus only did that so that he could pile his righteousness onto me. Him who knew no sin was made to be sin on our behalf. Why? That we might escape hell? No. But that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the bargain. What a bargain! Jesus said, give me all your sins and I'll give you all my righteousness. And that righteousness is credited to us. It's in our account as soon as we believe that Jesus died for us. Isn't that amazing? That's the gospel. And that righteousness is then achieved. It's not just credited to us. It needs to be achieved in us. But it's achieved by the Spirit's life. God even gives us, God even gives us the power of the Spirit so that we might become righteous. And you see a Trinitarian thread running through here? God's wrath, Christ's death, the Spirit's life. Okay? The Trinities of faith, hope and love and the Trinities of Father, Son and Spirit go all the way through Scripture, part of the unity. Then having said that, he said all the, at every stage God's wrath is on Jews who sin and Gentiles who sin. God's wrath is on Jewish righteousness and Gentile unrighteousness. Then he says, but Christ's death avails for Jew and Gentile. And he says, go for the Spirit's life. Don't go into legalism or license, but go into liberty of the Spirit and his life in us. That's how we escape from this horrible, vicious circle of sin and death. Then in chapters 9 to 11, his subject changes from righteousness to Israel. And he simply again goes through three things. Israel's past reduction to the remnant. He said not everybody who is Jewish is true Israel, but God always had a remnant. He always had some. He kept 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal. And even though there are lots of Jews all over the world, God has never failed to have a remnant of Jews who trusted him. And for the last 2,000 years, they've always been Jewish believers, however few. Thank God now they're multiplying like anything. There are at least 50,000 believing Jews now who believe in Jesus, and the number is multiplying rapidly. Hallelujah for that. It's a foretaste of the future. But Israel's past reduction to the remnant, sadly, chapter 10 talks about Israel's present resistance to the gospel. They are some of the hardest people to preach Jesus to partly because of Christian anti-Semitism in the past 2,000 years, but also because it cuts at the root of their Jewish pride and at their righteousness. The more they keep the law, the harder it is. I was with a party, some of you may have been with me in Israel, and we, oh, time, I'm sorry, I better not start that story. My wife's waving, thank you very much. <laughs> and Israel's future restoration to the covenant and then Paul appeals to his readers and he deals with these practical areas of how they conduct themselves in the state and society of Rome in which they live, paying their taxes, praying for the leaders of the state, and it's all there. So I hope that outline with the chapter numbers this side will just give you the feel of Paul's argument and the structure. Now you can go and read it. God bless you while you do. It's one of the most fruitful parts of the New Testament to read. And I know a number of people who've thought it wise if they were facing persecution and imprisonment, they have memorized Paul's letter to the Romans as a preparation for that so that they can take that in with them, stored in their heart. It's a big letter. It's a tough one. It's a meaty one. But it rewards those who search and who look for Christ. Search the scriptures because they bear witness of him. Well, thank you for listening.